Professor Spencer, this is our second interview. In our first interview, we looked at your early life and your career up to the point where you'd been lecturer for 15 years, culminating in your book, The Evidence of Children and your Paris sabbatical. In 1991, you were promoted to a readership. So can we look at your career from this point to your retirement in 2013 and then to the present? But before we do that, in the note that you kindly sent yesterday, you mentioned you'd like to pay tribute to Professor Meredith Jackson. Would this be an appropriate time in which to do that? Yes, I'd like to do that, please. Uh, Meredith Jackson was a big figure in the law faculty for many decades. And when Professor Robbie Jennings retired, no, when he had a 90th birthday party, um, he made a speech in which he mentioned with appreciation going to Meredith Jackson's lectures. And I was at the party and I was astonished to think that Jackson um, had lectured to him and also lectured to me. Jackson lectured to me, I think, in the year in which he retired. He wrote a book which everybody used to read before they started reading law called The Machinery of Justice in England. And I remember reading that before I came to Cambridge. Later, completely by chance, my wife and I found we'd bought a house next to him and his wife and we became friends and we used to go around there often and drink glasses of sherry with them in the evening and he said he was getting old and could I would I be interested in helping him produce a new edition of the book and I agreed to do that it was a long job because there was no online research in those days. So if you wanted to find some piece of official information, you went to the university library and there'd be a queue of other people and very busy library staff would eventually bring you what you wanted and then you would look through in the hard copy. Or sometimes you had to buy the publication from a Majesty's Stationery Office. So research that would now be done in a few minutes would take a day then. And sadly, Meredith Jackson had died by the time I had finished initially helping him and then finally completing without his help an eighth edition of the book. Um, it's a shame that I never mustered the energy to continue to do future editions and the book is basically evaporated from the CUP website and I don't think anybody reads it now but he was um, a figure who was like Glanville Williams in some ways I don't think he liked Glanville Williams much personally and thought Glanville Williams was too theoretical but they were very similar in a key respect which was that um, they looked through to the reality of things and were prepared to criticise legal institutions which they thought were defective. And undoubtedly, a lot of the criticisms that Meredith Jackson made went through to general understanding thanks to his book, and he was a considerable reformer in his time. He was a big, gruff figure a bit like a bear, and I think in his younger days he could be quite frightening, but I never found him other than a delightful man and his wife, and if I think of the people who were influences on my thinking, he was quite as important as Glanville Williams. Thank you, Professor Spencer. That's very interesting indeed. Fleeting mentions have been made by Professors Milsom, Stein and Mr. Pritchard, but not an extensive description or um, narrative, if you like. And I, after your uh, message yesterday, had found an entry by Peter Stein, a most interesting entry in the, uh, the British Academy memoirs, which mentioned inter alia his sailing exploits, which sounded to me very courageous. Yes. Uh, he was a sportsman of all sorts in his younger days. 
He played rugger extensively at one time. And I remember he said once that he'd gone to the doctor about some ache or pain. And the doctor said, have you ever strained a muscle in your body? And he said, in my younger days, I think I strained every muscle that it's possible to strain. <laughs> so I'm paying the price now. <laughs> well, returning then to your our interview proper, where we are at the point of your readership, and you were 45 years old then, and I wondered what the circumstances of this promotion were. Promotions to readerships and personal chairs were done in a very informal way in those days, as I discovered after I'd become a reader myself. In the law faculty, the existing readers and professors simply got together in conclave and talked about whom it would be a good idea to move up for promotion. And they then collect the necessary information and forward a file. And if the university authorities agreed, then out of the blue, you received a message that you'd been promoted to um, a readership or maybe even a personal chair. And the first I knew of it was when John Tiley, I think it was, contacted me to tell me, and I was very surprised. The system was not a particularly fair one in as much as it depended on your having attracted the attention of the people who were prepared to speak at the relevant meeting. And it's changed since so that everybody has to apply if they want promotion. And they have to put through the, have to go through the practice of writing what somebody sarcastically called a personal overstatement in which they say how great they are. Um, but that's how it was then, and those were the circumstances. Thank you. Were there any changes to your duties? No. I went on doing what I did before. I was paid more. Um, being promoted to a reader meant a bit more money for doing the same things and um, a higher status, I suppose, but functionally no difference at all. 1993 saw the second edition of your Evidence of Children book, and this was written at least partly in response to the 1991 Criminal Justice Act and the 1989 Children Act. This must have taken up a huge amount of your research time as a reader. The real work on the evidence of children took place for the first edition, which I wrote in league with a psychologist. The book is called Spencer and Flynn, and Rona Flynn was the psychologist. And I'd spent a number of years first nudged in that direction by Glanville Williams, looking into and writing about the law relating to the evidence of children. What got me into that was teaching the law of evidence and then having children of our own and realizing how inappropriate the legal rules about evidence were for dealing with children of that age. Asking little children if they understood the meaning of the truth, for example, um, it takes the mind of a great philosopher to set out clearly what truth is, and asking a little child of five or six makes little sense. I tried an experiment on our little daughter when she was three, and I said, uh, Dory, um, do you know what the truth means? And she looked puzzled. And then thinking she must have heard somebody shout it at somebody else in the house, I said, do you know what a liar is? She said, liar, what a fat lady has. Then next year I tried again and I said, do you know what a liar is, Dory? She said, yes, it's when you say you didn't do it. 
And I told that story to a number of audiences, and I found the police particularly enjoyed that description. And I later went to a Judicial Studies Board training session, and I found the judge doing a training session re repeating that story as something which had supposedly happened in court one day. <laughs> the uh, second edition of the book did involve a certain amount of work, because it had to take account of the changes that had happened in the meantime. But the real work for the book was taken, took place in what, 19, 1988, 1989 for the first edition. A, a, a paper that I came across of this vintage is your 1992 Experts Can England Learn a Lesson from France? And this was published in Current Legal Problems volume 45, and the editors had the following comments. They were then Professors Rideout and Hippel, and I quote, John Spencer considers in detail criticism of the use of expert witnesses. The present system is prone, he suggests, to produce examples of incompetence, bias, and unequal access to their services. Would the system used in France of court appointment be an improvement? This paper will be an authoritative source of comparison in the continuing argument on this issue. Yes. That paper did have an influence, I think. In this country, we retained the system of experts appointed by the parties in criminal proceedings. But I think under the influence of Lord Wolfe, criminal procedure rules were developed, which imposed various duties of, of good behaviour on expert witnesses, making it plain that they should owe their primary duty to the court, not the parties paying them, and also making provision for a judge in a complicated case to arrange for the witnesses for each side to have a conference first to sort out what they agreed on. Each type of system, whether court-appointed experts or expert witnesses, have their defects. And I think we have improved things in this country to try to eliminate the worst of the defects we previously had with experts in criminal proceedings. Thank you, Professor Spencer. You mentioned that during this time, you did a BBC World Service programme on the common and the civil law, in which you interviewed Lord Denning. Yes. Lord Denning was 92, or to be exact, as he told us, 92 and a half when we, gave, when we took the interview. He had largely retired from public life following criticism of some embarrassing things that he'd said in Parliament and elsewhere. And the person who was producing the programme said, is you serious about interviewing Denning? Isn't he senile? And I said, I think we may find that like a lot of very old people, he has good days and bad days. And let's see if we get him on a good day. And we did get him on a good day, and he gave us a beautiful interview, most of which was used in the BBC World Service programme. And I've often thought of what he said to me after the interview, and I've quoted it in lectures sometimes. He said, um, well, John, he said, he was like to be informal, what do you teach your students in Cambridge then? Oh, I said, oh, this and that. He said, do you teach them about Magna Carta? And I said, well, no, I don't, actually. He said, well, it's very important. He said, I always have my copy here, and let's read that article together. And he solemnly read out the article about um, no man being um, deprived of his life or his property without a, a judgment of his peers or the law of the land, or I can't quote it from memory. And I later looked up 
you couldn't do it online, you had to do it in citators then. The, the citations to Magna Carta in judgments, and I found that all the recent ones were by Denning in his judgments. It had plainly um, guided his thinking his whole time as a judge. And out of respect for him, I would always mention Magna Carta later if there was an appropriate occasion to do so. How wonderful that you've captured his voice. I was once looking up Lord Denning in an, uh, for something else, and I actually came across this BBC uh, interview. And it was a wonderful moment to listen to this voice, which otherwise would have been lost, actually. Yes. That's he was um, a Hampshire man from a modest background, and he had a Hampshire accent, which is rather similar to a Garset accent from the county next door where I was brought up. And a lot of people just lose their original accents when they move around, but some people don't. And clearly Denning never had. And I think it may have helped him in his practice at the bar initially because he sounded so different from the normal run of barristers. And you know how they said, well, my Lord, yes, I bid you with great respect, etc." that probably people listened to him. So he didn't cultivate it. I think he just couldn't lose it. And there was a great charm in listening to him. So the period of your readership culminated in the great move from the old schools to the West Road site, and I gather that you weren't involved in the decisions. Were opinions canvassed? They were. At that time, I was getting over serving as faculty secretary and had rather concentrated my energy on things other than faculty politics, and I stood aside um, I think one of the matters on which I do agree with Prince Charles is choice of architects. And I was worried about the decision to have such a modern building, but I took part, took no part in the discussions about it. And I just stood aside and saw what happened. Were you generally in favour of the move? Being somebody Well, perhaps I was more conservative then than I am now, so I suppose I was sceptical about it, but I could see we badly needed better accommodation for the law faculty. So I suppose I was in principle in favour, but concerned about how it would work out. So during your time as chairman, you inherited some of the problems, and I, from an earlier interview with Professor Baker learned that he had found that the architect, Sir Norman Foster, was a rather awkward man to deal with. Yeah. And I wondered whether in your dealings with Norman Foster, post the move, he was amenable to suggestions for improvement. As the law faculty had predicted, the building as designed and constructed initially had a terrible problem with noise in the library. I inherited the job of faculty chairman from John Tiley, who had seen through the move and the final stages of the construction. And I found I was faculty chairman when a lot of people were disappointed in the building that they'd had, having been excited about the prospect of having it previously. The big issue was the noise, and it was impossible to run the library properly when it was exposed to all the clatter and conversations from people coming out of lectures. And something had to be done about it. The real problem was persuading estate management to stand up to Foster's. In the file, I found a letter by John Baker, written on behalf of the faculty board to estate management, saying, we are seriously concerned that this design will result in a noisy library, and we would request the 
the State Management Department to obtain an independent expert report on the, the issue of noise. And there was a response from somebody in estate management saying, your request is noted, but it would be offensive to Sir Norman and we will not accept it. And I remember going to a meeting with estate management and reading John Baker's letter and their response. Eventually, when they nerved themselves to insist on something being done, um, Foster's did have the grace to be embarrassed about the difficulty and put forward a good suggestion for solving the problem. That big screen at the back of the reception desk, which looks as if it was always meant to be part of the design. And once we had that, the noise problem disappeared and we started to like the building again. And the day came when I found myself crossing a threshold and finding my heart rose going into that building instead of sinking as it had done almost every day when I'd gone in there as faculty chairman. So I came to love the building in the end and I appreciate it, but I never thought that that would be the case when I was faculty chairman. It sounds as though it was a very traumatic time, immensely diverting for the academics, particularly for yourself, with a very stark contrast to the old Cockrell building. Yes, though I can't say I felt sentimental for the Cockrell building. It was much too crowded for all the materials that we had and it had become tatty and run down. I later visited it after Keyes had taken it over as a college library and had spent a lot of money making it attractive again. And I could see what a beautiful building it was when it wasn't too full of books. But it wasn't suitable to our needs anymore, nor were the lecture rooms that we had scattered about the city. So, no, I don't regret the move. No word in there. Thank you. This brings us to the time of your professorship from 1995 to 2013. And I wondered if you could tell us about the circumstances of this promotion. I had to write letters of application. Um, and I can't remember whether I was successful in the matter of a personal chair on the first application or a later one. Um, but obviously I was honoured when I was offered a, a professorship by the university. Did this elevation alter in any way your teaching, your administrative duties, your research opportunities? There was an expectation that if you were a professor, you would devote your energies to the university rather than your college if you had one, which everybody in the law faculty did. And there was a rule then that you could not be a tutor in a college if you were a professor. So I wasn't able to be a tutor. I think I had still been a tutor in Selwyn College at that point. One of the first things that happened was there were gentle inquiries in Selwyn as to whether I might give up my college room, which alarmed me because, as you know, the law faculty building was built without rooms for people other than the immediate staff and one or two academics. And I could see that from a college point of view, essentially, I'd become a burden instead of a benefit. Some years later, when the university relaxed its rule, having made a great many people professors, and the economic scene having changed so that 
junior fellows of colleges had to spend all their time writing things to get promotion instead of having no money and time on their hands and anxious to be tutors to earn money. And I volunteered to be a tutor again at Selwyn and I was a tutor at Selwyn for I think about the last 10 years when I was in office. I took it on as a duty rather than an expected pleasure, but I found I enjoyed being a tutor. I was tutored to people in other subjects. And if I think of the things that made me happy in my academic career, being a tutor was one of them. Well, certainly in terms of your research, these 18 years were extremely productive. I counted eight books, 18 journal articles, nine book chapters, and it seemed to me there was a sharp swing in interest to comparative EU, continental, and particularly French law. So three of your eight books, 11 of your 18 articles, and seven out of your nine book chapters with only one book and two papers, while one, only one book and two papers followed up on your earlier pioneer work on children and evidence. Is this a fair conclusion to make? Yes. I was much more involved in comparative criminal procedure, comparative criminal law, um, continuing to explain the common law rules in continental Europe and vice versa. And I'd become quite a lot involved in the development of Europe, European Union criminal law, um, thanks to being recruited to the Corpus Juris project, which I expect you want to ask me about later. Yes, thank you. Also, this period would have coincided with the flourishing of the Dubois Matrix collaboration with Paris II that you established. Uh, it corresponded with its launching and attempts to make a success of it. A lot of my time and effort was consumed in that, together with other faculty colleagues who helped, like Catherine Barnard, and others who gave support, like Alan Dashwood. And meanwhile, there was the Erasmus programme as well. Clifford Chance provided money for a person with a faculty post to run and look after both programs and that relieved me and others in the faculty of a certain amount of administrative work but nevertheless both of those programs were a, a major concern and i took a lot of it took a lot of my time yes i also note that you had a special interest in the eu arrest warrant and other trans eu border topics what what drove this interest professor spencer EU law was not on the agenda when I was an undergraduate and there were uh, quite a lot of people in the law faculty who were anti-EU and I don't think anybody seriously imagined the UK would ever join, but of course it had. And one of the things that troubled the EU Commission was abuse of EU funds and the reluctance of the governments and the prosecution services of the different member states to pursue people who were dishonest with EU funds. And the Commission set up this study group to consider what to be done about it. And they wanted somebody who would work on it, who could work in French, which was still predominantly the language in which the EU operated. And I could, and I was an English criminal lawyer and criminal procedure lawyer who could manage in French. So I ended up being recruited to this group and helping to formulate the idea of a European public prosecutor, which was floated in our report in 1997. And the idea was that the European public prosecutor would have power to prosecute for frauds on 
European Union finances, and that would include the power to have arrest warrants issued, which would work throughout Europe. And that was what lay behind the idea of a European arrest warrant. And that brought me into contact with EU officials and colleagues in other member states who were interested in the whole idea of the EU and criminal law, and meant I was repeatedly asked to take part in expert meetings on the subject, and it kept me busy for a number of years. Very interesting, and presumably, Professor Spencer, this was linked to your being on the 95-96 EU study group on fraud on EU finances, which produced the Corpus Juris proposal for a European public prosecutor. Yes, that was my way in to it. I, I think it started when I was still faculty chairman and I received this invitation to join out of the blue. And it was a whole new development in my interest when I was involved in that. Can you tell us anything more about this, particular, this very important project? Yes. Our report in favour of a European public prosecutor to deal with EU fraud was first of all ignored by the British press and then discovered by an obscure um, ultra ultra Eurosceptic magazine who presented it as a plot by Brussels to cause the UK to abolish the common law and introduce the inquisitorial system. And some journalists at the Daily Telegraph, um, possibly Boris Johnson among them, I don't know, um, read this and made it headline news in the Daily Telegraph. Um, and that set the public opinion against it in this country. The Blair government was in charge at the time, and like the governments of a number of member states, they thought it was a step too far and didn't want it. But the Conservative Party internalised the conception of this as a plot by Brussels. And one of the first things the coalition did was to pass an act of parliament which said the UK should have nothing to do with the European public prosecutor unless there was a national referendum in favour of it, which meant, of course, it did never happen. And I've often said there are many academics whose brain children are disregarded by governments. I think I'm the only person ever to have had one thought to be so bad in his own country that legislation was passed to change the constitution to make it impossible for it ever to be implemented. Uh, eventually, in the EU, a European public prosecutor for fraud was set up, which is starting about now. The UK, of course, had nothing to do with it. I am sad about the structure of it. We wanted something simple, which would operate economically and efficiently to prosecute frauds, but I'm afraid the structure that emerged in the end is an enormous, complicated and expensive structure, so complicated I can't seriously imagine it will ever succeed in prosecuting anybody for anything. Um, but the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Very interesting. Um, Professor Spencer, it was also in this period that you served as a stand-in director at CELS. Yes. Uh, this was because I would got in with the law faculty, EU lawyers, thanks to my interest in EU criminal law. And a stand-in was needed to run cells um, after Alan Dashwood had gone on sabbatical leave. And they wanted somebody who was a professor in the faculty to do it, so I agreed to do it. Um, I can't say that I ran an innovative program, um, but it was one of the jobs that I did. And I again, some years later, when Catherine Barnard was um, director of it, um, stood in when she was on sabbatical leave. Right. 
uh, apropos the long-term effect the EU, the UK's departure from the EU will have on the trajectory of our legal system, what do you think that the main effects will be? Well, I can see in, as far into a crystal ball as anybody else can, but I would expect it to be a gradual lessening of the influence of EU law and a general um, turning in upon ourselves um, and less interest in what happens in continental Europe. All that said, the judiciary in this country, uh, on the whole, were quite receptive to EU criminal law, EU law generally, and I don't sense any great sigh of relief among the judiciary that we're now out of it. And our judges are intelligent people, and when they have a choice in a matter, I think have the sense to follow a good idea when they see one, wherever it comes from. During this time of your professorship, your research expanded in scope, European comparative studies, reproductive choices, hearsay evidence, evidence of bad character, general criminal theory, and a revisit to children and evidence. So if you had to summarize your journey in your professorial years, what would you like to emphasize as your legacy? What would I emphasize as what? As your legacy, your research legacy. Oh, goodness. I think, I certainly had an influence together with co-workers on the rules of evidence of vulnerable people. And that's important. I think I probably had some influence on the development in a better direction of the law relating to bad character evidence and hearsay evidence. I think I've always been a jack of all trades and a master of none, as the saying goes. And I always found any legal subject interesting when I was forced to pay attention to it. And that resulted in my taking up one interest after another, rather than concentrated, concentrating single-mindedly on one particular thing. So diverse, I think, would be my influence. You also, in this period, had quite an extensive collaboration with Italian academics. And I wonder if you could elaborate upon this. Yes. Um, the Italians were very interested in criminal procedure in what the French would call the Anglo-Saxon world. There'd been a big reform in Italian criminal procedure in 1988, and it was a big subject of academic study there, and there were a lot of doctoral students working on it. And I found I was receiving doctoral students from Italian universities who wanted help and direction on comparative work on aspects of English criminal procedure. And as a result of the contacts made there, I found I was repeatedly invited over to Italy to take part in things. And I realized that it would be a great advantage if I could speak Italian. And so I learned Italian. I went to night school at Hills Road Sixth Form College, where my children had been through, in company with Nikki and Christopher Padfield, who also learned Italian at the same time. And I spent quite a lot of time going to and fro from Italy and giving lectures there, latterly, sometimes in Italian. In the end, though, I became... Um, less and less interested in foreign travel because I found it more and more stressful and 
started to feel guilt about the impact on the environment of taking planes everywhere. So I gradually withdrew from that scene. Thank you, Professor Spencer. So st still during your professorship, you were the faculty chairman from 95 to 97. And this, of course, was the aftermath of the move. Mm -hmm. And you, as you've very interestingly told us, uh, had to deal with some of the teething problems, the glass screen and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any other incidents or anecdotes that you could share or put on record 25 years after the event? As many colleagues have said who were faculty chairman, it was a difficult time. I remember when I was first faculty chairman, um, feeling I was rather like somebody who'd been told to drive a high-speed train without being told how to do it. I'd had little experience of university administration, at least at that level. I'd been faculty secretary years before. And um, I found the job a worry. And in general, I wouldn't list it as one of the happy times in my life. But it was one of those jobs which you were expected to do if you were a professor and thought to have the administrative competence to do it. Um, I could tell many anecdotes about that time, but I'm not sure that they're particularly elevating. So perhaps, Leslie, we should move on. Right. Um, any other notable event during your chairmanship? The high point was when Her Majesty the Queen and the Chancellor of the University, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, came to open the building. The Queen opened the building. And I had the great honour of showing the Queen around the building. And John Tiley was one pace behind showing the Chancellor around the building. And it was an astonishing honour to meet the Queen and show her around the building. I will tell you one anecdote relating to that. The idea was that we should put displays on around the building, which um, would be politely looked at by the royal party. And we had a visit from an equerry from Buckingham Palace to talk about what these displays should be. And the equerry didn't seem to be particularly impressed by the idea of these manuscripts and those manuscripts. And I said half jokingly, I understand Her Majesty is very interested in horse racing. I wonder whether an exhibition of horse law would be appreciated. And the equerry said, oh, yes. That's a wonderful idea. I'm sure Her Majesty and uh, the Duke would much enjoy that. And I told my faculty colleagues about this and they divided two ways. Half of them said, oh, how shocking you've let us down again. What a stupid idea. The other half said, well, Her Majesty wants it. Her Majesty should have it. And we put on a display of horse law. Um, Andrew Tettenborn was a colleague in the faculty then, and he entered into the spirit of it. I don't think he knew one end of a horse from another when he started, but he um, went to a new market firm of solicitors for a couple of days to find out all about legal problems to do with racehorses. We borrowed a statue of a beautiful racehorse from the racing museum at New Newmarket, and we got um, placards with pictures of a horse involved in some lawsuit and in large letters briefly what it was about. And Tettenborn even managed to get a checked suit as worn by bookies to man the store. And the Queen and the Duke came round and smiled politely at the various other things. And when they saw this stall, their eyes lit up. And Tettenborn started explaining to them about this case that involved an allegation of horse doping. 
and he said, um, and your majesty, it's thought that it was done this way. And the duke turned to her majesty and said, oh, no, I expect it was probably done such and such a way. And the queen said, no, I expect it was probably done such another way. And there we had a three-way discussion on doping horses with Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, who smiled for the rest of their visit. And I expect if there's one opening they remember, it's opening the Cambridge Law Faculty. What a wonderful anecdote. Uh, also, on this during this period, you served on various committees and boards the UL Syndicate Board of Scrutiny, the Board of Scrutiny, the Exam Complaints Review Committee, and I wonder if you could comment on your contributions to these. The Board of Scrutiny um, is a body under the constitution of the university which publishes a review every year and draws attention to things that need attention drawn to them. Things were not altogether happy at the university at the time, and I remember we ended up um, ruffling the feathers of various sections of the university by our reports. The University Library Syndicate was, and I expect still is, a very civilised body. We had the impression that the library was well run, the meetings were well conducted, I think we did a useful job supporting the librarian. Um, and it was very quiet compared with the Board of Scrutiny. The Exam Complaints Review Committee, the proper name of which I forget, was something I did towards the end of my career. And we were the court of final appeal on complaints by students about um, things that had gone wrong in examinations. A number of the complaints were obviously ill-founded complaints. There were some which caused us real disquiet, and I hope we ensured justice was done by what we recommended. The main lesson I learned from that was how well we do things in the law faculty compared with some other faculties. And I felt reassured by the solidity of our examining process in the law faculty. Thank you. In 99 to 2001, you were a consultant to Sir Robin Ord's review of the criminal courts. Mm. And I wondered if you could say something about this work and what it achieved. Yes. Robin Ord was the director of this review, but he would had power to appoint consultants, which he did for various purposes. And he asked me to be a consultant to help him find out the reality of various things about continental criminal procedure and whether there were any lessons to be learnt. And he said, do you know enough criminal procedure lawyers in continental Europe who are English speakers who could come to an English language seminar. And with the help of the law faculty, no. Yes, with the help of the law faculty and the help of his administrative staff, we arranged a seminar. And it was all obviously um, confidential. And he was able to ask them the direct questions about how things actually worked and they were able to give him honest answers. And some of the some of the things he learnt there influenced the recommendations that he made. Um, his report, I thought, was excellent. And I wish the government of the day had taken up all of it instead of cherry picking some of the bits which it thought um, would attract favorable headlines in the newspapers. One of his central recommendations was that we should move away from having the magistrate's court and the crown court and have a 
tripartite division like a lot of other countries do. So we'd have the magistrate's court dealing with the small things only, which is what it was set up for centuries ago. Crown courts with juries only for the really important things. And an intermediate court staffed by a professional judge and two lay magistrates like the Crown Court when it's hearing appeals from magistrates' courts to deal with the bulk of other cases. But this was ill-received both by the criminal bar and by the magistrates, and it never happened. And I think it's a great shame it didn't, because I think it would have solved a number of problems which existed then and exist as badly or worse today. Thank you. I remember Sir Robin Ald's tenure in the Goodhart chair and um, how hospitable and kind he and his wife were in terms of inviting faculty to the Goodhart Lodge for some delightful parties. Robin Ald is a warm and hospitable person an Irishman by origin, and with all the geniality and warmth that goes with it. And that's what I would have expected him to do. In 2003, you received several honours. You were an honorary QC, an academic bench at the Inner Temple, and you were made an order of Chevalier. And I wonder if you could tell us the circumstances and the memories of the ceremonies involved? Sequentially, I think it was the French decoration that I was given first. And it was as a thank you present, I think, for collaborative ventures that I had done between the UK and Cambridge, particularly in France and French universities. Um, the Ordre des Palmes Académiques is a French order of decorations set up originally by Napoleon. And I got the bottom rung, which a cynical French friend said is normally given in France to primary school headmasters of great political reliability. It's a, nevertheless, a big honour for anybody to have it in another country. And that was um, handed over to me by the French ambassador in a session in Cambridge, who kissed me on both cheeks to the delight of various faculty colleagues who were present. Um, I had to have a letter from the Queen authorising me to wear a foreign decoration. And I wore it when I went to the ceremony in Westminster um, when I was um, made a made an honorary QC. And when I went in, an official said, excuse my asking, but what is that decoration you are wearing? And I said, it's a French one, but it's all right. I have the Queen's permission. And I remember um, the ceremony took place in a room with an enormous tableau of, I think it was the Battle of Trafalgar being won by the British opposite. I felt a little incongruous with the French medal when that was happening. Um, it was an exciting day. Very sadly, my wife and my sister, who we'd been planning to come, were held up by a delay on the railway. So they missed the ceremony, but they were present at the, ce the celebrations afterwards. But my our son was there too. Okay. Um, academic venture of the Inner Temple, I think that was an honour that was given to me downstream of being made an honorary QC. Um, it was very kind of them. I'm embarrassed that I've done so little for the Inn in the time that I've been an academic venture. You were also awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Poitiers. And this presumably was for your many contributions to French, English law and understanding collaboration. Was there a, a grand ceremony for this as well? Yes, um, as there is in Cambridge when we award honorary degrees. Um, I was invited to bring 
um, a group of admirers to watch. And it was in term, so who'd be free to go? But very happily, two retired members of the faculty were free and like to come. So as well as family members, Sir David Williams and Tony Weir joined us. And it was a very happy day in my life. Um, I've not been to the University of Poitiers for a long time, and most of the people I worked with there have now retired. Um, but I have the happiest memories of visit to Poitiers. And it sounds like you had delightful company as well from the faculty. It's hard to think of two colleagues more charming and amusing than those two. In 2006, you were given an LLD for the body of research work you've done at Cambridge over 30 years or so. Yes. Um, you supplicate for an LLD and then it's sent out to be refereed by various people and sometimes it's awarded and sometimes it isn't. I was cautious in applying because typically it's awarded to people who have written some monumental work in one particular area, but I'd dabbled in so many areas I wonder whether um, the answer would be, well it's all interesting but none of it amounts to anything. But I was successful, I was awarded the LLD and Yes, um, obviously very proud and honoured to have it. Professor Spencer, that brings us to your retirement. In 2013, you retired on the 31st of December and you've had uh, the proverbial busy retirement, although in the notes you sent, you said that you it was something of a relief to have given up supervising and serving on various committees. I continued to supervise for six years after retirement. Um, in Selwyn, the practice is that you have to give your room up when you retire, as it is in most colleges. And I was wondering what to do when Murray Edwards College approached me and most kindly said, would you like to be a by-fellow? We can give you an office if you're willing to supervise our students. So from 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19 and 19, 20, I was attached to Murray Edwards College and I continued to supervise in criminal law and criminal procedure and criminal evidence um, and effectively was like a junior teaching fellow there. Um, I'm glad to be out of supervising this year with all the difficulties from the epidemic. I thought I should, I decided to stand down before coronavirus was invented really because I shall be 75 at my next birthday and last academical year was my 50th year in practice and I didn't want to go on to the point where people were complaining that I was losing my wits. Um, my feelings not supervising now are mixed. I'm sad not to do it, though relieved um, not to be involved in the problems of this year. Yes, and I miss the students. On committees and so forth, um, I went to my last meeting of all the committees in the university that I belong to and was solidly thanked for my service on all of them and thought that's the end of it for committees. And now in this Norfolk village from which I'm talking to you now, I have found myself being on the parish council and I see replayed all the sort of personal issues which I'd seen play out with larger egos in the university over a great many years. 
looking back on some of the highlights of your retirement in 2014 to 16, you were the Vice Chancellor's Deputy. Yes. The Vice Chancellor has um, unpaid stunt doubles to stand in on social occasions where the Vice Chancellor has something more important to do. And to my surprise, I was approached to ask if I would be one of these. Um, and I did it for two years. And for the first time since I was an under, when I entered Cambridge as an undergraduate, I found I suffered from imposter syndrome when I sat on the vice chancellor's throne in the Senate House to distribute university degrees. And in the course of this time, I must have given hundreds of Cambridge degrees to people. I also had to preside at one or two discussions in the Senate House. And I also attended various university sermons and organized hospitality for the visiting preacher. It's a wonderful title to be a deputy vice chancellor. It's a certain amount of work. Um, but it's nothing like as important as the title suggests. I think nothing's ever made me prouder, however, than sitting in the Senate House, giving out degrees in the name of the university. Thank you. Uh, you were made a CBE in 2017 for reforming the law on the evidence of children in criminal proceedings and then to the protection of vulnerable witnesses, video recorded evidence, reform of the rules on competency to give evidence and so on. Was there a memorable ceremony involved in this? Oh, yes, very much. I was utterly astonished when I got a letter um, asking me if I'd accept the honour of a CBE. And I first thought it must be some kind of joke or possibly a scam. And there was a telephone number to ring for further details, and I rang it half expecting to get some foreign voice saying that this was the Honours Department, Ukraine branch or um, Ghana branch or something, and if I would send them a few thousand pounds, they'd happily take it forward. But it was genuine. And yes, uh, there was a magnificent ceremony at Buckingham Palace when it was awarded. Um, Prince Charles presided. It was a sad occasion because it was just after the Grenfell fire and Her Majesty the Queen that day was visiting the victims of the fire. But despite that, back, that um, unhappy national background, it was a wonderful day. And as I have um, jokingly said to people afterwards, Buckingham Palace can certainly teach Ryanair some lessons on the courteous and efficient control of crowds. Since giving up your academic career, you've had time to read, edit and write about criminal justice matters and you've had the time to follow your various hobbies, which include gardening, DIY, music, Punch and Judy and spending time with your extending family, as well as being a member of the parish council. Could you elaborate on any of these? Punch and Judy started when our children were small. And there was a time when our children were small and they had many friends of the same age when it nearly took my life over. Then it would come back at intervals afterwards as somebody remembered that I did it. And it took on another lease of life up here in the Norfolk village of Crunch when I found I was doing a round of church fates and so forth with it. Um, and I'm now doing it to amuse my grandchildren. Um, it's fun to do it. I think I can put on funny voices when I have to. 
and that and a certain degree of motor coordination um, is all you need to do pension duty. Um, the other things are things that I always like doing and I'm glad to have a little more time to spend on them now. Um, the parish council I've already mentioned um, and I try to do that conscientiously and I find myself trying to get my head inside local government law which is not a subject which I was previously familiar with. I'm still keeping going in academic life. I'm an editor of Archbold Review, which is the spin-off magazine from Archbold's Criminal Pleading and Criminal Practice, in which I'm also the editor of one of the chapters, the chapter on bad character and evidence. And from time to time, um, people get in touch with me to ask me about legal problems. And old students get in touch with me to my great pleasure. So I haven't wholly severed connection with the law, but it's nice to have time to do some other things as well. Okay. Professor Spencer, can you now metaphorically glance back over your shoulder in a career retrospective? And calling on the notes you supplied, there appear to be several items on which you have some very interesting and valuable views. And I wonder if I could just invite you to reminisce on some of these. First of all, the whole question of law reform in the criminal justice system, especially the law of evidence and the criminal appeal system. What are your hopes for the future and your, how do you feel, uh, could you describe your achievements? I think we such achievements as I have, I've probably already talked about. I confess I'm deeply depressed about the state of criminal justice in this country. It used to be essentially apolitical, a matter on which there was consensus between the political parties. And they were prepared to listen to informed people to try to think how the law should be reformed. Unfortunately, it got much taken up by the popular newspapers and the politicians of the day um, found they could score votes by agreeing with the less informed things which were published in the tabloid newspapers. And this has had a malign influence on criminal justice in this country. Something else which has had a bad influence is the reform of responsibilities for justice. We used to have a Lord Chancellor, it was the senior office in state officially, always held by either a senior politician with a legal background whose last job it was, and since he wasn't hoping for promotion, um, was somebody who was not prepared, not afraid to say what they thought and willing to offend people. And there was usually stability in the office, or it was sometimes somebody seconded from the legal system like Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, and they were respected and listened to. But in the Constitutional Reform Act, we had a change. The first Lord Chancellors appointed after that were ones who would have satisfied the job description for the previous ones, but since then they've been junior people of no standing and no legal knowledge and no interest. And um, it's turned into a junior office. Um, and I, it seems to me there is no nobody among the ministers who's actually interested in justice in any broader sense. And that's had a, that and the financial cuts have had a bad, bad effect. Um, just talk to my colleague Nikki Padfield and her husband about the effect on the prisons side by side with effects, other bad effects in criminal justice. And I wish I could see a happier future for it. Um, was there anything else you wanted to ask about? Uh, yes, Professor Spence, I wondered about the question of English law and the EU. 
um, particularly pertaining to fraud. Um, what are your hopes of a way forward after Brexit? As the newspapers were full of fishermen being thrown under buses and red lines and Kent parked end to end with lorries, in the background there were sensible negotiations taking place between officials on the future criminal justice cooperation with the European Union and its member states. Very quietly and tacked on as part three of the trade and cooperation agreement, there are a package of um, workable measures to continue criminal justice cooperation with Europe, um, which came as a surprise to most of us who thought the whole thing was being quietly forgotten about. So I have hopes of sensible cooperation continuing um, so on um, a less advanced scale. There was a strong common interest between the EU and the UK on maintaining sensible criminal justice cooperation on both sides. And um, neither side had any particular red line or um, devastatingly important principle. And it wasn't felt, I think, that the UK had to be made to pay for keeping the bits it wanted. Everybody wanted things to keep going as near as possible as they were before. So I think there will be sensible cooperation. Thank you. So apropos of the university and the faculty, and specifically the college system, you, of which you are not 100% uh, uh, in admiration of, uh, and it has of course been at the heart of Oxbridge for over 800 years, uh, what would you like to see in its place and what are, what are your criticisms? I've been the beneficiary of um, much practical help and kindness and friendship from two Cambridge colleges. And I'm not opposed to colleges. The trouble is the relationship between the colleges and the university. And I have a feeling that the colleges have more influence than they should and absorb a lot of money more than is really required and their influence is not always beneficial. For many years I was involved in undergraduate admissions in first one college and then another. I also saw as a parent what it's like for people to apply for Oxford and Cambridge, which all three of our children successfully did. I think if they hadn't been at Hills Road Sixth Form College, which suddenly understood the system, they might well have been tempted to say, this is so complicated, it's not for us. I think, sensibly, undergraduate admissions should be managed centrally. That people should state the preference of the college they'd like to go to if they're successful, but their faculties should organise the admissions instead of this fantastically complicated system, vigorously defended, of course, by a lot of people who've made their life work um, doing admissions in their particular college. Something else I think is this. When I was first a fellow at Selwyn, the total size of the fellowship was about a third of what it is now, but we still don't have, we still have about the same number of undergraduates. And fellows of colleges, even if they're not on the college payroll, consume a lot of resources. What are they doing? Why are they necessary? What really is our function? I've always thought the main function of the university was teaching undergraduates to a high level and Oxford and Cambridge 
fulfill the sort of role that the Grand École do in France in, I will say without any shame, training the elite of the country at a level necessary to be able to run the country. And do we need the colleges with so many people involved in them to do that? I'm sceptical as to where, whether they really do. Thank you, Professor Spencer. Several of the Goodhart scholars remarked on the what they perceived to be a slightly negative impact of the colleges in that they seem to suck the lifeblood from the faculty. Um, and uh, so... Uh, I remember reading an article which said that we are um, busy being Dr. Jekyll in the faculty and then Mr. Hyde when we go back to our colleges. And there is something about that, something like that. Um, if you're a fellow of a college and a member of a faculty, you find your, your allegiances are, are torn. But drawing the lifeblood out of the faculty, I'm not so sure. Um, we have an active group of faculty criminal lawyers and we um, interact thanks to an email network, um, which I set up, but the credit of thinking of it goes with Joe Miles, who suggested it. And through that, we're able to share ideas and keep in touch with each other, and that still keeps going. That's one of the things which keeps me in touch with the law at the moment. I feel I have a bunch of friends and active colleagues through that, even though I hardly ever see them, least of all during a pandemic. So I'm not sure that the colleges um, suck the lifeblood out of the faculty. I wouldn't be prepared to accept that. Um, the faculty waxes and wanes in terms of enthusiasm for faculty things. I think it depends on who's around at what time and who shows what initiative and leadership. Thank you. Are there any other items you feel moved to recall from your long and distinguished career which you could comment upon? I've commented at length about so many things. I think I'm commented out accurately, so maybe we should leave it there. Right. Professor Spencer, overall, are you happy with your achievements of nearly 50 years in academia? Do you feel that you've left the law a better system than you found it? In some ways, the law's better than when I started. I hesitate to say that the respects of which it's better are much due to my efforts. They're probably not better in some ways, worse in others. Um, the problem with old people is they're inclined to think that everything's got worse and is worse now than it was. And I don't take that view. Some things in the law are very much better than they used to be, even only a few years ago. Um, we have a better criminal appeal system than we used to have, even though it still has its defects, for example. So, um, some of the changes I deplore, but I'm conscious there have been many changes in the right direction, and I'm prepared to have some optimism for the future. So would you encourage students to follow law as it is now, or do you think there are more fulfilling ways to spend their lives and talents? As someone who's always found the law interesting, I would encourage people to follow the law as a career. What does make me sad, though, is the way things happen that so many of our best undergraduates end up working for city firms which seem to spend all their time enabling rich people to get richer and pushing money around. I sometimes think it's a waste of everything we taught them at university if they just then apply their energy to helping people make money 
and avoid taxes and so forth. Um, it's a fulfilling job to be a high street solicitor. And there was a time when a lot of graduates from Cambridge would become high street solicitors doing a range of work which made themselves useful to a lot of people in society. But changes in the way that solicitors firms work and are financed mean that it tends to be only the really big firms that have the money to pay trainees. And that is the direction in which most of our students go. For those who have the ability, the bar, though risky, is, I think, an intellectually more fulfilling career to take. But it is a risky career. The criminal bar is depressing but interesting. Um, we badly need good people to go into criminal practice. One of the things that worries me most about the criminal justice system is the endless cuts to funding, which means that it's very difficult for anybody to earn an acceptable living either at the criminal bar or in practice as a criminal solicitor. And inevitably that will affect for ill the quality of criminal justice. So yes, I'd still encourage people to read law. I wish I could persuade more of them to do something other than become city solicitors. Thank you. Well, all that remains now is for me to thank you most sincerely for another fascinating account I hope that in your next interview, we can discuss some of the important issues in your published work. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Spence. I'm very, very grateful to you. Thank you, Leslie.